All right, so how to, how to be an anti kenoticist let, let me put a subtitle on that, without losing uh, the kenosis. I want to begin by considering three biblical texts, then uh, section 8.2 from our confession, and then we'll just dive in from there. And I'm going to do this. After I read the three biblical texts, I'll just pray uh, for our time together in this session. John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Christ, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for sending our Lord Jesus Christ, your only Son, begotten before all ages, in the fullness of time, come to redeem us, to take our nature, to be made like unto his brethren in all things without sin. We bless you and thank you for him. Lord, give us clear minds and insight. Teach us by your Spirit and guide us in the paths of truth, even as we contemplate the manner of this great and almost unspeakable mystery of his incarnation. We ask it in his name. Amen. I want to read uh, Confession 8.2. Uh, you'll find this in the back of the hymnal if you uh, want to look there. And then we'll get into some consideration of canonicism, what it is, why you should know about it, why you should avoid it, and why you should endorse a biblical doctrine of kenosis. The confession says this, the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, being very and eternal God, the brightness of the Father's glory of one substance and equal with him who made the world, who upholdeth and governeth all things that he hath made, did when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin. Being conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit coming down upon her and the power of the Most High overshadowing her, and so was made of a woman of the tribe of Judah, of the seed of Abraham and David, according to the scriptures, so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion, which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. So we consider uh, the modern Christological milieu, the theological discussions that surround Christ and particularly that surround the incarnation, we are at something of a crisis moment and have been here now for well over 150 years, uh, in particular due to a theory of the incarnation that requires that the son undergo some sort of loss or divestment, some alteration from his pre-incarnate state in order to become flesh, to become poor, and to empty himself and take on the form of a servant. So I want to begin uh, just in, in, in sort of plotting a course for how to respond to this by first setting up the scenario, considering the classical view uh, very briefly, and then considering some of the major objection to that, and then moving on from that to a consideration of kenosis in particular. That will be our second consideration. Thirdly, um, what I call unpromising strategies for anti-kenoticism. That is to say, ways of opposing it that are ill-advised, one much more ill-advised than the other. And then finally propose a way to be anti-kenoticist in saying that the son is the personal terminus of the human nature and that that is in fact an orthodox way forward that has not been recently invented, but has actually just been laying there uh, waiting to be kind of retooled and, and re-expressed. So first, let's consider the conflict within the current Christological milieu. Traditional Christian theology insists upon the divine word's immutability in the incarnation. If we read Second uh, London Confession 8.2, we should read it in light of Confession 2, 1 and 2, which indicates 
that the one who is very and eternal God is also all the other things that we say God is there, immutable, impassable, simple, infinite, perfect, most absolute, and so forth, that in calling him very and eternal God, we're saying all those things we say in confession 2, 1 and 2, we're saying are true of the person of the Son. Therefore, whatever it means to take upon him man's nature, it cannot mean the surrender of the state of being, of, of divine being and all that that entails. In other words, it is in fact God who is incarnate, not an artist formally known as God. <laughs> this essential divine identity leads many classical theists to insist that in the incarnation, the Logos underwent no change in his divine nature or person. I want to be very careful about this. We'll, we'll return to it at the end of our talk. That we don't want to say the divine nature was unchanged, but the divine person, you see, he underwent changes, but the nature didn't. Just a quick thing on this, and this is no claim to fame or anything, but my nature also hasn't undergone a change. God created it, ex nihilo, which is not a change, um, and then I've been human ever since. And I'm, I'm planning on staying that way. Um, but I, on the other hand, have undergone many changes. And so we want to say with the son that his immutability is not simply an immutability of nature, but because it's an immutability of nature that gives him an immutability of person, he's also an immutable person. Consider a few statements just from some classical theologians, most of these pre-reformational and then one of them reformational. Augustine of Hippo says of the Son that he is, quote, the maker of all things, unchangeable with the Father, unchanged by the assuming of human form. Cyril of, Cyril of Alexandria says, the word was, was made man as we are, but was not changed. John of Damascus says that, quote, the person of the word of God became person to the flesh, and in this way the word was made flesh, and that without any change. Thomas Aquinas, much later uh, than those theologians, agrees and says, the word, of course, is entirely immutable. Now, I would maybe say any more, I'm not sure the of course holds anymore, but at least in the 13th century, the word of course is entirely immutable. Thomas adds this, no change was made in the word of God himself, but only in the human nature which was assumed by the word in accord with with which it is proper that the word was both temporally generated and born, but to the word himself, this was not fitting. The word did not undergo a change, though he assumed to himself a new nature. We'll talk more near the end about how these theologians propose that that happens. Uh, and then the Protestant reformer, Peter Martyr Vermigli, stresses the Logos' perfection as being both unenhanced and undiminished in the incarnation. He says this, but the word of God was equally perfect, just lock onto those two, that phrase, equally perfect, both before the incarnation and after the assumption of his humanity. Whatever perfection he had as incarnate, it was not something more than or over and above or in addition to whatever perfection of being he had as eternal logos. That he was not perfected by the incarnation, the incarnation did not enhance him, and certainly the incarnation did not deprive him of any perfect blessedness that he eternally possessed with the Father and the Spirit. Such is the classical view. Down the ages, across the continents, pre-Reformation, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, have all said that the incarnation does not involve a change that the word or the logos undergoes. Nevertheless, several contemporary theologians are critical of this traditional account and insist that a real incarnation requires forfeiture and or at least acquisition of some sort on the part of the Logos. It's argued that for the word to become flesh, John 1.14, to empty himself by taking the form of a servant, Philippians 2.7, from which we get the word kenosis, ekenosen uh, is the word for he emptied uh, in Philippians 2.7, and to become poor, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, the word must undergo some real alteration or movement from his pre-incarnate state. Things just couldn't stay the same if the word was to become flesh in the fullness of time. The word would have to move from some pre-incarnate state. If nothing else, some condition of his had to be lost to him. 
Classical theism, with its denial of all such movement, seems to rule out any possibility of a real incarnation. Who holds this view? Um, I want to propose that you find representatives of this both among Roman Catholics and among Protestants, including Reformed Protestants, um, at least in the, in the modern context. The, uh, the Jesuit theologian Jean Gallo, who's written a book um, on, who has written a book uh, entitled Who is Christ? A Theology of the Incarnation, the majority of which I find very instructive, very learned, very helpful. But when he comes to the very moment of having to account for the son's incarnation and becoming man, he demands that we relax the traditional claims of strong ontological immutability. In fact, he says that the, quote, mutability of the incarnation, even there it tells you that he understands the incarnation as involving mutability. By the way, Thomas Aquinas had suggested that there might be something like mutability taking place on the part of the human nature, but in fact, Gallo is talking about an, a mutability of the incarnation that mutates something in God himself. The mutability of the incarnation cannot be changed, uh, he says, cannot be a change located solely in the assumed human nature, as classical the, the, uh, theologians had claimed, but that, quote, the newness lies first of all in the realm of the divine before affecting the human nature of Jesus. If God is gonna become man, God is going to have to change something in himself as God. He's going to have to give up something. He's going to have to build out or augment something. God's dynamic activity in the incarnation, Gallo says, quote, demands an authentic innovation in God himself. You'll find similar, you'll find similar demands in other major and more well-known Roman Catholic theologians of the 20th century, uh, perhaps most outstanding among the Catholics. You find claims similar to this in the works of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, von Balthasar is, for Catholics, what Karl Barth is for Reformed Christians. Uh, Swiss, mostly traditional-minded, um, very cool. All right. It's not bad if you can do that, but most of us, anyway. So Gallo calls for a relaxation of the demands of immutability to accommodate innovation of being in God. The Protestant canonicist C. Stephen Evans, taught many years at, at Baylor University, demands change in God as a condition for real incarnation. And you'll often hear this language, real incarnation or authentic incarnation requires some sort of real alteration as a precondition for it. Evans says this, if there is no change in God, then what can it mean to say God takes on human nature? Th that's not a bad question. It's not a bad question. Um, the answer is where the problem is. He says, a real incarnation must not be merely an addition to God. It must make some difference to and in God. I, I submit just as a, I'll add a little commentary as I go along through some of this. That requires that an historical event actually have some sort of causal influence upon the intra-divine life itself. I submit to you that that is, in its most modest form, a nascent kind of panentheism. As soon as the world starts to have a causal relationship to God, God is now part of a single causal nexus with the world, and he is a thing in the world. Maybe the most amazing thing in it, maybe the most powerful and wise thing in it, but now he is an item in an order of being of which he is but a member, perhaps its highest. The reformed theologian, Donald MacLeod, indicates sympathy with this line of reasoning in as much as he narrates the incarnation in terms of a change the son undergoes from his pre-incarnate state. I bring up McLeod. This gets a little more up into our kitchen, so to speak, as Reformed Christians. McLeod's book, The Person of Christ, has been used in many conservative and Reformed seminaries as a standard textbook in Christology courses. Listen to McLeod as he narrates for us the incarnation. He's speaking now of the Son pre-incarnate. He possessed all the majesty of deity, performed all its functions, enjoyed all its prerogatives. He was adored by his Father and worshipped by the angels. 
He was invulnerable to pain, frustration, and embarrassment. He existed in unclouded serenity. His supremacy was total, his satisfaction complete, his blessedness perfect. Such a condition was not something he had secured by effort. It was the way things were and had always been, and there was no reason why they should change. But change they did. And they changed, this is still McLeod, and they changed because of the second element involved in the kenosis. Christ did not insist on his rights. He did not regard being equal with God as a harpagmos, which is the Greek term for um, something to be grasped or a thing of grasping. That's the end of the quote. Um, if you look at the list of things that are all changed on McLeod's telling of it, again, uh, majesty of deity, performance of divine function, enjoyment of prerogatives, adoration by his father. I don't know quite what he means by that. It's not really a biblical way of speaking, but maybe he means something like the love of his father. Uh, I can only guess at it. The worship by the angels. Does that change in the incarnation? Um, when the firstborn comes into the world, he says that all the angels of God worship him. This says that when he came into the world, that changed. Seems not quite right. Invulnerability to pain, that is to say impassibility, frustration, that is to say efficacy with regard to his purposes, um, unclouded serenity, total supremacy, complete satisfaction, and blessed, perfect blessedness. Romans 9.5 says that the Christ um, is God blessed forever. McLeod says until he wasn't. This is a kind of, I, I submit to you, this is a kind of canonicism that has found a comfortable home inside of conservative reformed Christianity. The implication of the statement is devastating, to say the least, for the theology proper of the reformed confessions uh, narrowly and for classical theism more broadly. And yet something of this sort has come to dominate much of modern Christology. Among all the modern Christological proposals that stand opposed to a kind of classical Catholic small c and reformed understanding of the incarnation, perhaps none is as widespread as canonicism. McLeod's statement is arguably a version of canonicism. Part of canonicism's staying power, part of its enduring power, is first its underlying ontological univicism, which is very much the stuff of modernity, as well as what I call a competitive cosmology. Don't get worried about that. But it's a cosmology that says, if it's God acting, then the creature has to give way. And if, the, if it's the creature acting, then God has to give way. We find this uh, in a lot of um, Arminian and open theist rationale about the way God interacts with the world as a primary as opposed to secondary causes. And that if I'm free and I act, then God has to make space for me to really be me. And if God is acting, then I can't be acting. It's a kind of either or cosmology, what I call a competitive cosmology. If you bring that kind of cosmo where God is actually now just an agent in the world who has to share causal explanatory space with other stuff in the world, so that if God becomes flesh and we find that God's power is a little, um, a, a little too overwhelming. If he's supposed to be weak unto death, then the divine power has got to be either divested or paused to make space. But there's a cosmolot, please understand, that underneath, underneath canonicism, underneath this idea that something's got to give for God to become flesh, is, a, is an unarticulated cosmological belief about how God and the world relate. I think it would be good if we articulated what exactly that cosmology is, because I think it's carrying more water with regard to mis mischievous Christologies than we tend to recognize. Suffice it to say that if this is the major alternative to the classical orthodox expression of the immutable logos, the one who is very, very an eternal God, as our confession says. If canonicism is being offered as an alternative, it's an alternative that has been wildly successful and is now deeply entrenched. Secondly, then, that, that's just the lay of the land, my first observation. Secondly, let's consider the canonic Christology and its basic rationale. And I want to just introduce you to some canonicists and what they say so you can kind of get a sense of how they're thinking through the incarnation. So what is canonicism? 
Obviously, it borrows its term from a Bible term, Philippians 2.7, and kenosin, kenosin. But kenoticism, it's, it's somewhat something like rationalism. I want to oppose rationalism, but I don't want to oppose rationality or embrace irrationality. I'd like to oppose kenoticism and not oppose kenosis. Um, so this is how to be an anti-kenoticist, not how to be anti-kenosis. So what is kenoticism? Stephen Davis, who's a major proponent of, contemporary proponent of kenoticism, says that, quote, kenotic theories try to understand the incarnation in terms of limiting the divine nature in certain ways. I think it's a nice kind of shorthand of what it does. He adds this, a kenotic Christological theory is one that explains the incarnation in terms of the logos temporarily giving up or laying aside or divesting itself or emptying itself of certain properties that normally belong to divinity. So close the quote. Davis is pretty convinced that all Christians who believe in the incarnation at all are already committed to kenoticism. They just need to own their commitment. In fact, it's a fundamental, for him, it's a fundamental piece of basic Christian orthodoxy. He writes this. Every orthodox believer in the incarnation must believe that the Logos gave up at least something in order to be, in, in becoming incarnate in a man. The usual manifestations of the divine glory, for example. Or we might say that in the incarnation, the Logos gave up the normal incorporeal life of God. Or we might say, following Philippians 2, 7, that the incarnation gave up the form of a non-servant. I think in that context, that would be the morphe theou, the form of God, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 6. Um, to give up normal incorporeal life is to say that though he was immaterial as divine, he gave up the immateriality uh, that he had and is as God. Um, the usual manifestations of divine glory, um, this is to say that in some respect of manifested glory, the lights went out when Christ became man. Um, I think that, well, let me, if I get an opportunity, or maybe later in the Q&A, we can return uh, to that concern. These divestitive, what I call divestitive accounts, the giving up accounts of the word's assumption of a human nature are generally grounded on two basic arguments. First, the scripture clearly teaches this in, pa in passages like Philippians 2.7, 2 Corinthians 8.9, John 17.5, the glory I had with you before the world was, and then it's often read as, and then gave up and didn't have for a while and would like to have it back again. That's, I mean, that's, that's often how it is read and preached. Um, so the text is claimed to support this kind of on the face of it. Secondly, that he had, that the, the second sort of piece of logic is that he had to remove or at least suspend the operation of certain divine attributes that seem wholly incompatible with the limitations of his human nature, usually including but not limited to knowledge, power, and presence. Or if, those, if someone wants to hold on to knowledge, power, and presence, they want to just simply deny the omni. So no omnipresence, no omniscience, no omnipotence, uh, even if, at least in potency, he holds on to the capacities to be reactivated later. The, probably the father of modern kenoticism is a 19th century German Lutheran named Gottfried, Gottfried Tomosius. Uh, and Tomosius argues that absolute at, makes a distinction between relative attributes and absolute attributes, and he wants to say that there are relative attributes that can be given up, and there are absolute attributes that can't be given up without losing God altogether. Um, he's happy to say that God is composed of accidents plus substantial properties, um, which is to say definitely no divine simplicity at work in his theology kind of restraining him. Um, you'll find the same thing in the new modern kenosis uh, theorists like Stephen Davis who just simply says, we can just talk about omnipotence or omnipresence or omniscience as accidents, that will be the most convenient thing, and then we can just simply say that God can survive as God the loss of an accident. Like, I can survive the loss of accidents. Like, I can stop speaking, which is an accident of action, and still be this human. So I can survive the loss of an accident. God can too, and therefore we don't lose godness. Um, that, of course, presupposes that God is composed of parts. Uh, and any argument against God is composed of parts would be a good argument against that kind of explanatory structure. Tomasius says that the Logos divests himself of the relative attributes of omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. He says this, quote, 
he renounces them in holy love in order to be able to in order to be able to experience in truth a humanly natural life a life in the flesh and to redeem us during this stage he is no almighty all present all knowing man and what is more he is not because he wills not to be there's a kind of voluntarism here god can just by will shut off divine omniscience if it suits the redemptive purpose back to Timotheus, but even as the incarnate one he is and remains the absolute power, truth, holiness, and love that is essentially God, just not acting on it. And so now the properties are really like potencies that can be actualized by a sheer act of will. It's a kind of a voluntarism. You get a little bit of the, uh, get a little bit of this voluntarism in Stephen Davis, who's a modern canonicist. He says, a coherent canonic theory will hold that what is essential to God is not, for example, omniscience. Ah, omniscience is not what is essential to God, but rather the more complex property of, this is all hyphenated, being omniscient unless freely and temporarily choosing to be otherwise. That's actually the property that God has, not actually being omniscient. And then, and then uh, Davis ends up saying, the same point will be made with the other divine properties such as omnipotence, omnipresence, and so on. It's a kind of on-off switch in which God's operations can just simply be sort of opted in and out of at will by individual divine persons. This is the approach. Understand, though, underneath this, this is what Timotheus and most canonicists uh, are concerned with, the ability to experience in truth a humanly natural life. It just feels like you can't, be su- you can't suffer in weakness unto death if you're at the same time upholding all things by the word of your power. It just seems like you can't not know the day or the hour if indeed you declare the end from the beginning and do all things according to your purpose. It just seems like one person can't hold these two things together without a complete meltdown of conflict. Which is to say, uh, they want to say, but he can still be true God and true man because what, he just can't do God's stuff and be true God and true man at the same time. So he's got he's to dial down the divine operations. He's got he's to truncate his knowledge. He's got to really put, the, put a leash on his power. He's got, to, he's got to gear down the divinity to be a man. Otherwise, both at the same time and the same person would be an insufferable tension. The late 19th and early 20th century Anglicans and Scottish Presbyterians, at least several of them, of course, great exceptions, uh, follow the canonicists this way. A couple statements from them. John McPherson says this, when the Son of God, the divine Logos, became flesh, he submitted himself to the limitations of time and space and surrendered. Now, I think we should just really quickly interrupt McPherson here. So far, we should say that the Son, in becoming man, did in fact accept and draw to himself, to his person, all the limitations of that human nature. When he was eating fish in Galilee, he wasn't teaching on Solomon's portico in his human nature at the same time. Back to McPherson. This is, this is the trouble. And surrendered the eternal mode of existence in assuming the temporal mode of existence. It's the surrender that is the trouble. That he couldn't, he couldn't be here as opposed to there and then also be everywhere with regard to his divine nature without something breaking. Back to, back to McPherson. This of necessity meant that the limitations of his mode of manifestation gave no room for the exercise of those attributes of God which do not recognize the restrictions of time and space. It is quite distinctly implied in the gospel story and throughout all the New Testament that Jesus Christ in his incarnate life was absolutely without the divine attributes of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. Andrew McPherson, or Andrew Fairbairn, who follows just a little bit later in the Scottish tradition, says this. A supreme renunciation was necessary. He had to stoop from the form of God to the form of a servant. This act is described as kenosis, an emptying of himself. Now this is precisely the kind of term we should expect to be used if the incarnation was a reality. That's, ah, but what does he mean by real incarnation? Back to Fairbairn. It must, it must have involved surrender, humiliation, There could be no real assumption of the nature, the form, the status of the created son, if those of the uncreated were in all their integrity retained. 
He's being very clear. The integrity of the divine operation and being cannot be held together and the incarnation be real. Back to Fairbairn. These two things, the surrender and the assumption, are equal and coincident, but it is through the former, he means the surrender, that the latter must be understood. He cannot become man, and he cannot take on form of the servant, and he cannot become poor if he stays rich, if he stays in the full exercise of all his divine prerogatives uh, and power, something's got to give. Um, and I think that's what's underlying this. Something's got to give. It's a, cosmolog a competitive cosmology where for God and man to be present in one person, something has got to be geared down, either real humanity, ah, but we don't want to give up real humanity. In fact, that's probably why this arises in the 19th century. There's a huge emphasis upon the historical Jesus and everybody scrambling to give full-throated affirmation to the historical Jesus, which is good, but you can only give his full affirmation to the historical Jesus if you gear down his divinity to make space for the realness of his humanity. In addition, I think that many, I think on the face of it, if you just read the canonicists themselves, um, it's pretty stark, the demands are pretty stark, and most in our tradition are wary of it just on the surface, the way it, it sounds wrong uh, to our ears, um, and it is wrong, and if you probe it, there are lots of ways to sort of pick this apart. Um, it's rightly rejected. And yet, and let me just, let me just bring this up as a, as a kind of proposal, and yet I do submit that even for those who are formally uh, anti canonicist and don't like the doctrinal clear expression of canonicism, it is still very possible that some form of canonicism, that the ghost of canonicism is still haunting our exegesis and our handling of scripture. I want to propose just two kinds of texts, two particular sorts of texts in which this tends to happen, even for those of us that don't like the sound of canonicism. The first is with regard to all passages describing Christ's descent. When he says that I came down or I have come from heaven, or I have been sent by my Father, texts like John 3.13, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven. That phrase, descended from heaven. John 16.28, I came from the Father, I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. A canonicist interpretation explains the descent as a desertion and relocation. That is to say, was in heaven, now isn't in heaven, but plans to be back there very soon. Okay, a, a kind of relocation, a, a descent by desertion is, how, is one way to describe it. In fact, we have enshrined this in so much of our music, not just recent music, um, it's been around for a few hundred years. We sing, he left his father's throne above. Right? So vast, so infinite, his love. Um, what do I want to say? No, he didn't. <laughs> and then we can kind of work from there. Um, in fact, you will find theologians down the ages, not just Catholics, but also Protestants, and even before the Catholics, uh, church fathers, who are quite emphatic that the, descent, that the descent is not a relocation from heaven to earth in the sense of leaving heaven behind. That's not a past state. It's not a where he was but is no longer. Thomas Aquinas offers this with, into the question with regard to the mission of the Son. How can someone be sent on a mission? How could the Son be sent on a mission and yet still be with the Father? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and was God is the proston theon, the Word was with God, something that is losable. Does divine mission, redemptive mission, separate, the put some distance, so to speak, between the persons as Trinitarian persons? And this is what Aquinas says. What is so sent as to begin to exist where previously it did not exist is locally moved by being sent. Hence, it is necessarily separated locally from the sender. This, however, has no place in the mission of a divine person, for the divine person sent neither begins to exist where he, previously, where he did not previously exist. Are you, pause for a second. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord, and so there can't be from that state of being, which is the only state of being we should attribute to the pre-incarnate son, that's not a relocatable, desertable state of being, nor does he cease to exist where he was. Do not I feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. That is, in fact, the way the son is present uh, in his pre-incarnate state. That's not losable. 
The mechanism for his descent is not local departure and relocation, but rather the assumption of a human nature on earth. In other words, how does he come down? Not by leaving heaven, but by taking something created into personal union with himself. The assumption is the mechanism of the descent. Thomas says this, the son is said to be sent by the father into the world inasmuch as he began to exist visibly in the world by taking our nature. The assumption of human flesh is, is what accounts for the descent, not a relocation from or desertion from heaven. Listen to John Calvin, very clear on this in his Institutes. Here is, this is Calvin, here is something marvelous. The Son of God descended from heaven in such a way that without leaving heaven, he willed to be born in the virgin's womb, to go about the earth and to hang on the cross, yet he continually filled, filled the world even as he had done from the beginning. Calvin, and by the way, that is so unoriginal with Calvin, the medievals have worked that over very thoroughly, and so have the fathers before them. Calvin later in his institutes, two books later, says, in this manner he is said to have descended to that place according to his divinity, not because divinity left heaven to hide itself in the prison house of the body, but because even though it filled all things, still in Christ's very humanity it dwelt bodily, that is by nature and in a certain ineffable way. And the certain ineffable way is undoubtedly the way of hypostatic union. Hypostatic union is the way he came down. If hypostatic union doesn't require a local desertion and relocation, um, mysterious as it is, then we shouldn't say he came down from heaven, so he was in heaven, and then at a moment later he wasn't. Christ doesn't have a momentary life, a kind of metricatable temporal life, apart from his assumed human nature. But to say that he was in heaven and then wasn't, the only locus of that state of was but is no longer would have to be a divine manner of existence. That introduces mutation and kenosis even unwittingly. In addition to that, one other text uh, to consider, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, though being, uh, for our sakes, he be, who, who, though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, makes it sound like moment A had riches, moment B gave them up and was poor so that he could make us rich through his poverty. Um, John Lawton, who's an anti canonicist but he's unable to kind of resist the temptation of this text, says, in this verse there is no question of a form which might continue to exist, but only of those riches which Christ surrendered for our sake. But I, I submit to you that the surrendering is actually read into the text. Becoming poor is not the same thing as losing riches. It might be for you because you're temporal, mutable, you know, can't be rich and poor at the same time and in the same respect. But Christ is not rich and I'm suggesting that he's rich and poor at the same time, just not in the same respect. In every way he was rich, he remains immutably rich, but that while remaining what he was, he took to himself a manner, a state of humiliation and lowliness and servanthood and was what he was not through the hypostatic union. But just like the hypostatic union does not require that he divest himself of power and knowledge and omnipresence, so also it does not require that he divest himself of riches. The becoming, an interesting, and one, well, a little quibble, why not? The text doesn't say he was rich. It just doesn't say that. It's a present active participle, a present active participle, and it actually comes after the poverty. He, he who for our sakes became poor, being rich, that through his poverty we might become rich. He brought riches in his person to our impoverished condition when he took that condition to himself in personal union. I think you lose the way in which the person of Christ enriches us through the incarnation when you make him leave his riches behind. If Christ is going to come down, bring the riches. <laughs> bring the, and Paul, I think, and the way Paul orders the words and the tense of the participle indicates that that's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did. The particular Baptist, John Gill, gets at this. I had some more Aquinas. I'm predictable that way, so I'll go with a Baptist for a change. <laughs> Gill says, the son, though rich in his divine person, became poor in human nature to make his people rich. Exactly. The locus of the poverty is not a state of divine being that was rich and isn't any longer. That's not a mutable state of richness. That's immutable. He brings the immutable riches of his divine person and he takes them into personal union with our poverty that through his poverty, 
which is ours that he took to himself, we might be made rich because he brought the riches with him. All right, thirdly, briefly, unpromising strategies of anti-canonicism. Let me leave, let, let me, I'll just mention one, I won't deal with it at length. The first one and the more egregious one is to simply make kenosis original to the Godhead itself so that when Christ emptied himself, if it was always his nature to empty himself, then there was really no change because he was already a self-emptying thing from all of eternity. So basically, if you can't, it's kind of like if you can't beat them, join them and swallow them up. Uh, and I'll just make canonicism an eternal state of divine being. And so when God empties himself, that's just God being God like he always is. You get that in Hans Urs von Balthasar. You get a more exotic version of that in Bruce McCormick in his recent book, The Humility of the Sun, subtitle proposing a reformed canonicism. Um, in the end, at least for McCormick, I can't resist this. McCormick is actually saying the kenosis of the human nature is actually constitutive of the eternal divine person retroactively, so that in fact, when the eternal divine person becomes poor for our sake, that poverty was already constitutive of his person from forever. I don't know how that isn't panentheism. Um, the world now playing a constitutive role in the divine identity. In fact, he goes as far as to say that the son's incarnation and redemptive mission is in fact the whole reason the father begat him anyway. Salvation is the reason for the eternal generation as a final cause in McCormick's proposal. Um, all forms of pan panentheism. Uh, I suspect that most in our circles can, can kind of smell that and stay somewhat clear of it. Um, if they can't articulate exactly why it's wrong, they know that it is somehow. The more appealing strategy, and one that I want to propose is much closer to orthodoxy, but isn't quite orthodoxy, is actually the strategy of saying he did not subtract something from himself in the incarnation, but he rather added something to himself. This has become so ubiquitous in the last 150, 175 years that it is now simply taken for granted that that is the traditional view. And we're told over and over and over that that is the traditional view, that that's always what the Orthodox have said, that he didn't become man by losing or subtracting anything. Rather, he became man by adding something to himself. You get this in several, can I just, I'm just going to simply observe this right off. The Bible never says that anywhere. That matters. This is not natural theology that we're talking about. So you're going to need some texts, um, or at least some pretty tight reasoning to argue that the assumption is additive in character. In fact, nowadays, it's just taken for granted that to assume means to add unto. I submit that that is an intellectual mistake that actually has some interesting theological negative consequences. A um, couple texts indicating this. Stephen Davis says, classical theories try to understand the incarnation in terms of the Logos simply adding to itself a human nature. Christian Van Driel says, the classical theologians think about the incarnation in terms of an addition. Before the incarnation of the word, the second person of the Trinity had one nature, divinity. In the incarnation, the second nature is added, humanity. The difficulty with this. Um, also, oh, by the way, it's widely attested in the modern literature. No less of a, of a great historian, Alaw Grillmeyer, in his great uh, work uh, on um, uh, Christ in the Christian tradition, says, that historical existence as man can never express what the pre-existent Christ is in himself because this kenosis is a taking or better an adding, the first kind of being not done away with, who is on equality with God adds something to his divinity, the form of a servant. It's interesting because Grillmeyer's book is exhaustively footnoted in original and primary texts, but he doesn't, and it's outstanding because he offers no primary text saying that in the early church. Um, John Murray, very orthodox, very anti-canonicist in his instincts, says that there in the son's incarnation, there's no divestiture or transmutation. No change, Murray is saying, no change, no divestment. That's very good. He then says that the incarnation means addition, bad, conjunction, passable, um, not subtraction. You can almost, and by the way, I think Murray's instincts are right, and with a slight tweaking of his language, um, it's easily, it, it, you change one word, change addition to assumption and stop thinking that addition and assumption are interchangeable notions and, and everything's actually just right in that statement. Um, several other modern theologians say the same. Um, two things in response to this just briefly. First, um, the scantness of evidence supporting the addition language is remarkable. 
Um, now, if you're looking for evidence dating from the middle 19th century to present, it's legion. But if you get before the Canadis, if you get back before the 19th century Canadicist debate, in which the Canadicists made a big play for subtraction, you don't really hear very seldom, almost never, I can't think of any place explicitly offhand that argues for addition. Addition almost seems like a badly conceived orthodox counter move against Canadicism beginning sometime in the 19th century. But it became so quickly accepted and so widely accepted that now we're just simply told that that is the traditional and classical view. Not only does scripture not use the word added ever to refer to the incarnation, which by the way, it doesn't have to use the word for the concept to be there, but I simply suppose, I propose that the, the lack of the word means that you're gonna have to do more proving uh, than just simply quoting Ephesians two, or Philippians 2.7 again. Um, in, addition to the, in addition to that though, there's also the near total absence of evidence in the church fathers, medievals, and Reformation and Puritan writers. They just do not speak this way. They talk about taking on an assumption all the time. Seldom ever do they, do, uh, seldom ever do they mention addition, and when they do mention addition, they excoriate it as the wrong thing to say. Thomas Aquinas considers this objection. The objector is saying that, the, that a perfect person, that the Son, the Word being God, cannot become incarnate. And this is what the objection, now this is not Thomas's view, this is the view that he's going to, to contend with, but this is what the objector says. It would seem that it is not befitting to a divine person to assume a created nature, for a divine person signifies something most perfect. Now no addition can be made to what is perfect. Uh, by the way, Thomas is not going to disagree with that point. Neither is John Owen or John Gill or many others. Therefore, since to assume is to take to oneself and consequently what is assumed is added. This is what the objector says. What is assumed is added, which by the way is just everywhere now. What is assumed is added to the one who assumes it does not seem befitting to a divine person to assume a created nature. The concern about divine perfection is one Thomas takes very seriously, and he grants the major premise, no addition can be made to that which is already perfect in being. The objector is not wrong about that, Thomas grants it. But he does not grant the major premise that assumption entails addition. He rejects that argument. What's interesting is many modern anti-canonicists accept the objector's minor premise and don't think much about the major premise. It's almost the, the opposite now. This is how Aquinas responds. Since the divine person is infinite, no addition can be made to it. Hence, Cyril says, we do not conceive the mode of conjunction to be according to addition. Just as in the union of, God, of man with God, nothing is added to God by the grace of union, but what is divine is united to man. Hence, not God, but man is perfected. Elsewhere, he says that the Son of God is, quote, not in any way augmented or perfected by the assumed nature. And in fact, the reason he says is, quote, the word of God from all eternity had complete being, esse completum in hypostasis or person. There is no state of being in which he does not exist boundlessly because he is infinite and you cannot add to that which is infinite. That same rationale gets picked up in the Protestant tradition. John Owen says this, Though Christ took our nature to be his own, quote, it was no addition unto him. He'll say that repeatedly. It was no addition unto him. Why? Because of God's aseity, self-sufficiency, and plentitude of being, there cannot be something lack, there cannot be a real state of being lacking to him. There can be modes of states of being lacking to him, but that's not a lack of being. That's a lack of a lack of being. To take that which is low, lesser in being and lacking what you have is not to take is not to add something to yourself, it's to join something to yourself that already, uh, in which you already contain all the perfections in an unbounded, super eminent manner. Cal, uh, Owen says this, God alone wants nothing, stands in need of nothing. Nothing can be added unto him, seeing he giveth life to all, uh, life, breath, and all things. That's his rationale for why the son cannot add to himself. He says this, that of the Son of God, quote, that nothing can be taken from him, that's anti canonicist nothing added unto him. That's the bad strategy that he's rejecting. And then finally, John Gill on this point. By the, this is Gill, by the incarnation, nothing is added to nor altered in the divine nature and personality of Christ. 
The human nature adds nothing to either of them. They remain the same they ever were. The human nature has a subsistence in his person and has a glory and excellency given it, but that gives nothing at all to the nature and person of the divine word and son of God. Who gets? Who's, what, let's put, let say it differently. What gets in the incarnation? Human nature gets dignity and honor and richness conferred upon it beyond our wildest imagination and expectations. What does the person of the Son get in the incarnation? Nothing, he lacks nothing to begin with. You can only get if you first don't have, and there's nothing that he doesn't have. He takes our poverty to himself, but that's not an addition, that's the assumption of a kind of negation. He takes lack of being to himself, compared to his own being, which cannot then add to his being. Um, this is just a small sampling. In fact, what really surprised me in this is just how ubiquitous the anti-addition, anti-canoticism is in our own tradition and in the medieval and patristic tradition. When the question of addition is brought up, which it isn't very often, it's almost universally rejected explicitly and in no uncertain terms by the Orthodox. Um, I, I propose that they were right and they, uh, they saw some difficulties with addition that we're just kind of gratuitously overlooking. I also don't mean to say that everyone who's ever said addition um, meant something sinister by it. It was an unfortunate choice of words, perhaps, because it was being used by everyone, uh, and it just needed a little kind of re-examination, and actually, I don't really have to change my theology to give it up. I'm going to start using the word assumption, and then I'm okay. You're okay, too. All right, finally, and this just by way of exit, what should we say instead? What should we say instead? The impossibility of attributing subtraction or addition to an infinite God together with the firm conviction that the divine word became flesh and so is true God and true man compels theologians to find a way to coherently articulate the word's assumption of a human nature that satisfies all the data, not makes the mysteries comprehensible, but satisfies all the data that he is true God, that he's true man, that he did not change in the incarnation, um, and yet that it was in fact the Son of God who was born of Mary, that Mary is for that reason, because who is in Mary's womb is God. She can be called Theotokos, or, or God-bearer, mother of God, and that in fact who died on the cross is God. Can I say God died on the cross? I can, because of who died. Can I say that God was born of a virgin? I can say that, yes, because of who was born of her. But how does he not lose his mutability in this? What is the nature of of that union with the human nature. Historically, theologians have expressed this, not all, uh, in equally clear terms. Aquinas in very clear terms, Turretin in very clear terms. You'll also find it occasionally in Owen here and there, um, in which they say that the divine person of the word terminates the human nature. Let me explain just briefly what they mean by this. The human nature as such cannot exist except as the existence of someone. Just before we came this afternoon, I was having lunch uh, with my friend Antonio. Antonio is a human, uh, he's here, I am too. Uh, and uh, the two of us were sitting at lunch and you can imagine like if I go home to my wife and I say to her, you know, tomorrow, yeah, I had, I had uh, lunch with a, uh, rash, with a uh, rational soul and body, which I did, she might say, well, who was it? Of course. What if I were to say to her, it was no who. It was just a rational soul and body. That would be very odd. <laughs> Call the doctor. Um, because rational souls and bodies, natures of a rational sort only exist in concrete reality as the rational souls and bodies of someone. The rational soul and body exists and is completed and brought to its terminus in a person. The question is what supplies the, hoop, the hypostasis or personhood to the nature of Jesus of Nazareth? It is, in fact, the divine person himself. Now, this is the question. Is it a fixed law of human nature that it terminate in a finite created person? That's how it is with everyone in this room, uh, I take it. But that's not necessarily a fixed law. It's only necessary that it be completed or terminate in a rational hypostasis. That that hypostasis be created 
is not a strict necessity. So you can have a truly created human nature that requires personhood in order to exist concretely in reality. If that personhood is supplied by an uncreated person, then that uncreated person is the who that is that man. What does he get from that? If he's infinite in being, he gets nothing. What does he give in that? Him, his own self, his own personhood. Who, which is what's necessary for what to exist, is received by the seed in Mary's womb from none other than a divine person. How does, the divine, how does that nature receive personhood from a divine person so that there is no created person there? By the, by the mysterious and ineffable act of assumption. In taking to taking to, which is Philippians 2, 7 language. The taking to and the uniting to the person of the Son grants the who that is necessary for the concrete subsistence and reality of the created what. Who is born of Mary is uncreated. What is conceived in Mary's womb is created. An uncreated person is born of Mary by virtue of a created nature that he takes into personal union with himself. I propose this by way of conclusion. That to terminate or to complete does not necessarily require that that which terminates, in this case the divine person, lose or gain anything, but only that he supply the requisite personhood to the rational nature for its subsistence. The incarnation is not something the son gets. It is, in fact, the giving of personhood to, it, to, to, to our nature conceived in Mary's womb. To terminate, to give personhood, and therefore bring to completion, to make a concrete, re real uh, human, does not require necessarily that the son undergo a change. Two analogies, well, let's just stick with one. Um, and these I'm borrowing from Garigou Lagrange, who I think borrows them from Dominic Banyas. We can think of this by way of analogy of a point to a line. That a, lo a point can terminate a line. You know that a real line, geometric, a, a, an abstract geometrical line doesn't really exist. It's just endless. So you put a little couple arrows on the end and it goes forever. But if you want to actually, if you actually want to concretize a line segment, you're going to need points that terminate it, an A and a B, so to speak. When point A terminates line segment AB, it enables the line segment to come to concrete realization. But in terminating the line segment, the point itself does not lose anything or gain anything. Points are weight, I mean, on paper you have to draw them, but points are strictly speaking weightless, extensionless. They don't get extension by becoming the terminus of a line segment. They don't lose anything that they had by becoming the terminus of a line segment. The point is, re is required for the line to exist in reality and, the, and, it, and it even becomes intrinsic to the line but it does not receive or lose anything of its nature or of itself in so terminating. If I could just extrapolate that by way of analogy, we could say this, that the divine word who terminates his assumed human nature by perfecting it in being and subsistence, even becoming intrinsic to it and subsisting in it, is himself utterly undiminished and unimproved by the hypostatic union that results. But that doesn't mean there's no improvement in the hypostatic union. And the improvement, the gain, the addition, the, the acquisition of riches lie entirely on the side of our nature and of Christ's people who are saved through what he did in that nature, ennobling it, enriching it, making it fit and worthy to be present with God in heaven. The gainer in the incarnation is us, Christ's people. The loser in the incarnation is the devil whose works he came to destroy. The son in the incarnation gains and loses nothing, but gives abundantly. God, you are good to us. You set forth your son of the mystery of the incarnation. He was made like unto us in all things with the exception of sin. Lord, that he in that nature fulfilled all righteousness, suffered unto death, and was again raised from the dead. We bless you and thank you that it was indeed God the word 
who was made man and that he did not lose his divinity, but with all the riches of his glorious person, packaged them into a human nature by becoming person to that nature and in that nature achieving our salvation. We bless you and thank you for him. And it's in his name we pray.